Ladies and gentlemen, we're connecting with each other around the globe. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Dr. Deepak Chopra, our famed speakers, members of the Board of Trustees of the University, convener and members of the Aar Khan University Special Lecture Series, including President Feroz Rasool, faculty, staff, students, alumni, friends, and well-wishers of the university, our community partners, and distinguished guests. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome, Karibu, to the Aar Khan University Special Lecture Series. My name is Kulsum Ghayas, and I'm pleased to introduce the Special Lecture Series and today's esteemed speaker. This lecture series was instituted in the year 2000, 20 years ago, as part of the university's mission of encouraging broad-based education through invitation to eminent and national international personalities, providing a forum for debate and discussion on matters of general interest. Our previous speakers have included notable international personalities such as His Royal Highness, Prince Hassan of Jordan, a highly respected intellectual and peace activist, as well as Karen Armstrong, an author with worldwide readership. We're also proud to have hosted speakers from Pakistan, including the late painter Gulji, the famous mountaineer Nazir Sabir, the human rights activist, the late Asma Jahangir, and of course, sadly, also the late humanitarian Abdul Sattar Idni, among others. Today, the SLS Organizing Committee is pleased to welcome Dr. Deepak Chopra. Dr. Chopra, founder of the Chopra Foundation, a nonprofit entity for research on well being and humanitarianism, and Chopra Global, a modern day health company at the intersection of science and spirituality is a world-renowned pioneer in integrative medicine and personal transformation. He is the author of an overwhelming 90 books translated into 43 languages, including several New York Times bestsellers. His 90th book and national bestseller, Meta Human, Unleashing Your Infinite Potential, unlocks the secrets to moving beyond our present limitations to access a field of infinite possibilities. Time Magazine has described Dr. Chopra as one of the top 100 heroes and icons of the century. Dr. Chopra is a clinical professor of family medicine. At the University of California, and both of internal medicine, endocrinology and metabolism, a fellow of the American College of Physicians, and a member of the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. He serves as a senior scientist with Gallup Organization and hosts the number one health and well being podcast, Dr. Chopra's Infinite Potential and Daily Survey. Ranked Dr. Chopra as the 17th most influential thinker in the world and the number one in medicine. We're very pleased to have Dr. Chopra with us today. He'll be talking about the future of leadership and well being. I imagine it's a topic that will be resonant with the wider audience that has joined us from all over the globe. It is truly unprecedented time. Please use the email sls at aku.edu to send in your questions. I'll repeat, the email address is sls at aku.edu. After Dr. Chopra's talk, my colleague Amin Hashwani, who's a member of the SLS Organizing Committee, will moderate the question and answer, and we'll conclude with a vote of thanks from our president, Mr. Feroz Rasool. Dr. Chopra, may I now invite you to begin? Your slides will be displayed and will be forwarded on your queue. Dr. Chopra. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kulsum Gias. Uh, thank you, President Feroz Rasool. Thank you, Amin, and uh, thank you, the entire community of the Aga Khan University. I have a long-term relationship with the community that goes back 30 years when I met uh, Prince uh, Sadruddin Ali Khan. Today we are here to talk about the future of leadership and well-being um, at the same time because these are very critical issues for our time. I think uh, most people uh, looking at the global situation today would agree that we are in a moment of uh, uh, what might be called crisis in the world. There's um, great ideological discord in the United States, but across the world. 
there's religious conflict, there is war, there is terrorism, there's extinction of species, there's climate change, there are, there are mass migrations across the world. And right now we're also in the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic, which is literally devastating the well-being of the world. So what I'd like to suggest today is that uh, humanity needs a new story. And the story that uh, humanity has embraced for the last uh, several thousand years um, has uh, not worked. The story of ethnocentrism, bigotry, hatred, prejudice, war, terrorism, eco-destruction, extinction of species, climate change, um, it's not working. And we can see that the world is in the moment um, going through a process that can only be called grief. Grief happens when a way of living uh, starts to slip away and ultimately dies. I have, as a physician, observed grief and observed uh, loss and the fear of death uh, throughout the years, as anybody in the healthcare field uh, knows that uh, when people go through this process that we call grief, and they go through certain stages. First, they feel victimized, why me? Well, right now, the whole world is suffering. Um, and then the second stage is anger and hostility. And then there's uh, resentment and all kinds of grievances. And uh, in a short time, a patient who's confronting death actually starts to feel not only frustrated, but resigned and very fearful. Uh, and only some people find acceptance of the situation as it is. And right now we need to find acceptance of the global situation as it is, because without acceptance, there is no shift, no change. Once you have acceptance, then there is the possibility of a creative response. And the creative response, I think, has to be a grassroots global um, rewiring of our uh, collective consciousness. Uh, we need to see the death of an old story and the birth of a new story. And the new story could be a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful world. After all, everybody wants that. Uh, if you go to Palestine and you talk to the children there and the parents of those children, that's what they want. That's what everybody wants, peace, social and economic justice, progress, education, creativity, and a higher vision. And so today, many uh, social scientists are talking about the idea of what is called emergence. Emergence happens when an old story is on its deathbed. And that old story is certainly being questioned right now, even with the COVID pandemic. And now, of course, with the great uh, unrest in the world as a result of racism and bigotry and um, conflict, ethnic and religious conflict as well. So that story seems to be not working. And therefore, a new leadership uh, that looks at well-being in all its different dimensions is very important. So as a senior scientist at the Gallup organization, we look at well-being in many different compartments or buckets. The first bucket is uh, career well-being. Are you happy with what you do every day at your job? Um, do your strengths get noticed? Are you part of a team that complements each other's strengths? Do you have shared vision? Is there some kind of emotional and spiritual bonding between you and your colleagues? All this is very measurable. So if I asked you even one question just now on a scale of one to 10, how happy are you with your career? And 10 would be extraordinarily happy and one would be miserable. And you could intuitively, just intuitively, give yourself a score right now, as I'm asking you this question, how happy are you with your career? Uh, without going into specifics, 
if you score eight, nine, and 10, you're thriving. If you score five, six, seven, you're struggling in some area in your career. And uh, if you score less than five, you're suffering, and you probably also has a physical uh, chronic condition. This is established data. Similarly, one can look at well-being in the social and relational compartment, or what we call emotional and social well-being. Do you have friends and family who support you, who hold your back, who you could go to in times of trouble, who you could count on for help, whether it's resources or emotional help or spiritual counseling on a scale of one to 10, where are you? And the same rules apply. If you uh, score six, seven, you're struggling in some area, eight, nine, and 10, you're thriving, less than five, you're suffering. Same thing about physical well being. Do you, on a scale of one to 10, what is your energy level? That simple question. If you say, I have no energy at all, or I have maximum energy more than I need to do all the things, you can give yourself a similar score. Similarly, community well being can also be um, assessed. And there are metrics for that. Do you feel safe in your community? Are you uh, comfortable walking alone in the community? Is there some um, service in the community that you're involved in? Do you get involved in a vision for your community, whether that community is local or it's an extended community or it's even a national community or a global community? It doesn't matter. But community well-being is measurable, as is financial well-being. On a scale of one to 10, are you happy with uh, your financial security? Do you have retirement? Do you have uh, uh, social security? Do you have uh, uh, the ability to uh, make a living even if you were sick? All these things go into your overall assessment of well being. And then there's one simple question that can be asked on a scale of one to 10, how's the quality of your life? That's one question intuitively and if you score one obviously your life is miserable if you score 10 your life is great and your future is great so based on this um, uh, with the help of many communities and many organizations we've created a template for what the future of leadership could be coming from a grassroots level uh, of course, we all depend on political leaders, we depend on spiritual leaders, we spend, depend on uh, cultural leaders, artists, humanitarians. But right now, what the science of emergence is saying, when you have maximum diversity of talent, maximum diversity of opinion, maximum diversity in the various disciplines, humanitarianism, philanthropy, science, technology, uh, these days, uh, very important to include people who are artists, who are musicians, who are poets, who are storytellers, who are entertainers. If you have maximum diversity of background and storytelling, if you have total transparency, if you have open feedback, and if you have shared vision and you're willing to complement each other's strengths and set your ego aside for the moment, and you are incubating in what do you want? What, who are we collectively? What do we want at the deepest level for our family, for our communities, for our organization, for our political party, for our country, for our religion? It doesn't matter. What do we want? What is the deepest motivation for what we do? And what is our higher purpose? What is our calling right now? Forgetting about our individual selves, what do we need to do for our communities, for our countries, and for the planet? This is very important right now to, for us to engage in this reflective inquiry and also ask ourselves, despite all the challenges that the world is having, what can we be, be grateful for? Just asking that question actually calms down. The mind uh, opens the heart to abundance Gratitude is a very sacred emotion, and you cannot feel gratitude and hostility at the same time. In fact, we have done studies now that show that when people express gratitude, even silently to themselves, 
inflammation goes down in the body. Inflammatory markers go down, the immune system gets fine-tuned, and uh, people get better uh, physically. So there is no difference between what's happening in your biology, what's happening in your mind, and ultimately what's happening in your consciousness, which is the source of all your thinking and all your feeling and all your memories and all your imagination and all your aspirations. So reflective self-inquiry and practicing stillness of the mind through meditation and prayer, reciting maybe the 99 names of Allah because they're all the qualities of infinite consciousness and infinite creativity and infinite compassion and infinite empathy and infinite love. If we do all this, these practices, there is a possibility for us to create a, a new worldview. And that new worldview must include social justice, economic justice, empowerment at a grassroots level. While we depend on our political and ideological leaders and religious leaders, I think it's also time to embrace what is being called the, the, um, the uh, what is called the starfish model of leadership. The old model was uh, what is called uh, the spider model. You know, the spy, if you crush the head of a spider, the animal dies, the biological organism dies. But if you take a starfish, you see that it has six limbs. You cut one limb, it grows two. You cut all the six and it grows 36 limbs, which means the power is distributed. And today I think a grassroots leadership, which is global, which functions both online and offline with self-organization in terms of service, in terms of uh, spiritual practice, which means simply self-awareness, and in terms of uh, community, and in terms of a greater vision where we take responsibility, where we have integrity, authenticity, a higher calling, that could definitely bring about healing in the divide that we have culturally, religiously, politically, etc. So may I, with that, show you the first slide that I have here. And uh, if uh, uh, you are handling this uh, uh, technology, thank you. So well-being should be the top priority in the workplace. Uh, according to all the studies, the number one source of stress uh, is uh, job stress in the workplace. Uh, Almost 20% of people in the United States that I know are actually engaged in their work every day. 80% are either disengaged or actively disengaged. And that's because of stress in their life in one of the five buckets that I mentioned. Let's go on to the next slide. So with that data, it's obvious that we need to manage our well-being both uh, mentally spiritually and physically, and they're all actually very deeply related. So here I've outlined for you the seven pillars of well-being uh, with the very important metrics that are easily measurable and that make a big difference in our physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Everything that is you're seeing here, seven pillars of well-being, is actually measurable. And so uh, it is now known that if you have lack of sleep, you're prone to inflammation, which uh, makes you more susceptible to disease. In fact, if you want to look at lifestyle measures for premature death from cardiovascular disease and other illnesses, lack of sleep and hostility are the number one and two risk factors. Today, we are also seeing a lot of literature on the effects of meditation or silencing the mind or self-reflection or self-inquiry or transcendence and how that alters the activity of our genes, the science of epigenetics. So even people who go to silent retreats or attend spiritual self-inquiry meetings or recite uh, the names of the divine, you can see inflammation coming down, you can see um, uh, 
the immune system optimizing itself. You can see uh, genes that activate healing go up or homeostasis go up some 17 fold. You can see genes um, that uh, cause inflammation go down significantly. So for the first time now we have a science why spiritual practice actually helps manage our biology, regulates our biology. Anytime you have anger, resentment, hostility, guilt, shame, depression, it's associated with both acute and chronic inflammation and leads to susceptibility of both acute and chronic illness. In fact, right now during the COVID-19 pandemic, it's very clear that those who are getting very sick have acute and chronic inflammation, which is measurable and which can be managed through uh, the arts, through uh, music, through poetry, through uh, uh, prayer, through meditation, through exercise, through mind-body integration, whether it's yoga or tai chi or qigong or martial arts. And there's a lot of literature on how movement and mind-body techniques actually stimulate a nerve in the body called the vagus nerve, which counters the effects of the sympathetic overdrive that causes inflammation in the body. Similarly, nutrition has now become very important as a source of healing because of the increased uh, production of industri industrial food in the world and contamination of food through chemicals, inflammatory products, antibiotics, hormones, our food is generally contaminated unless it comes from directly from the farm, unless it's rich and diverse in, in um, uh, phytochemicals, which are nutrients derived from the energy of the sun present in plants and vegetables, these alter the microbial landscape of our gut, which sends information to the brain. So your gut produces more serotonin and dopamine than your brain does. And these are the molecules of emotion that affect everything from behavior to biology. So now we know that we can reverse inflammation in the body through nutrition. And then there is maintaining our own biological rhythms, which means the cycles of night and day, the cycles of sleep and wakefulness, digestion, metabolism, elimination, sensory experience, relationships, and finally self-awareness, asking deeper questions, what is the meaning and purpose of our life? What is our shared vision? And how can we heal ourselves and heal the world? If we follow these seven pillars of well-being that I've outlined, it is now uh, suggested that 90 to 95 percent of chronic illness can be avoided and some of it can even be reversed. Only 5 percent of disease-related gene mutations are fully penetrant, which means <clears throat> if you have a genetic mutation for a disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, autoimmune disease, only 5% of those mutations will guarantee the disease. The rest are dependent on lifestyle, and these are the pillars of well being. So, 95% of illness is now thought to be preventable. And the remaining 5%, which is genetically determined, new technologies are emerging, such as gene editing and CRISPR and so on. So if we understand what is happening in the area of mind-body practices, integrative medicine, lifestyle, and technology, the future is actually very bright for treating uh, both acute and chronic illness. COVID-19 has many implications for our ecosystem. And it is actually, in a sense, a hint in how we can uh, uh, reverse climate change. It's obvious now that climate change is possibly reversible. It's all obvious right now that uh, oil-free economies are possible. It's obvious right now that global cooperation is the only way to not only tackle the pandemic, but also the financial catastrophes that are occurring across the world and new currencies like cryptocurrencies, new communities are cropping up that suggest the new paradigm where we may want to move in the direction of a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier and joyful world. And all the social science is showing that we know what it takes to resolve conflicts. We know what it takes to uh, enhance creativity. We know what it takes 
to actualize a vision. And for that, we need a new leadership as well. So let's move to the next slide. And this leadership, as I said, has a different model that looks at all these areas of well-being, which I have outlined career well-being, social well-being, physical well-being, financial well-being, community well-being, they're all inseparably interlinked with each other. So if you have a happy friend, your chances of being happy go up by 15%. But if your happy friend has a happy friend, it goes up even more and it keeps going up. Ultimately, the science suggests that even the happiness of your perceived enemies improves your well-being. So this is science. I'm talking about science right now. We know what it takes to create well-being in these different buckets and these different areas of well-being. And now it is our collective will and our collective desire to complement each other's strengths and vision to actualize this well-being, not only for ourselves, but our communities, our societies, and ultimately the whole world. So let's move to the next slide here. Um, here is my acronym for the new leadership. And I've been teaching this uh, course on conscious leadership um, at uh, Kellogg, uh, School of, uh, uh, Kellogg School of Management in Chicago, but also have taught this at uh, uh, Harvard and other institutions, including Columbia University in different formats. But this is basically the backbone of the future of leadership as I look at it. Leaders need to look and listen more than speak. Leaders need to look and listen with the heart, with the soul, with the mind, with the body. They need to have a vision that we can all embrace and that uh, we agree on, that this kind of uh, shared vision involves servant leadership, not uh, influence peddling, cronyism, corruption, and power monger mongering, but a sincere desire to change. And we are seeing this globally in the new generation. The new leadership requires emotional bonding. Emotional bonding occurs when we have empathy, when we feel what the other feels, when we have compassion, when we have the desire to alleviate suffering when we have love, but also the love is actualized into some action because love without action is meaningless and action without love is irrelevant. But when you have love and action at the same time, you can create remarkable changes. We need to expand our awareness. You know, um, my new book, Meta Human was mentioned and Meta just means beyond and human in this um, case means how can we go personally beyond our conditioning, whatever that conditioning is, historical conditioning, economic conditioning, um, conditioning that goes back to the beginning of civilization. We recycle our conditioning and part of that conditioning is very important for cultural creativity and cultural richness. But part of that conditioning also prevents our creativity. So meta means beyond and human in this means beyond the conditioned human mind. How do we access inspiration, insight, imagination, and a new vision, not only for ourselves, but for the rest of the world and our communities? D here stands for dare to dream, a new reality, but also do it, make action plans, which are powerful, you know, smart action plans, stretch more than we can reach, make everything measurable, uh, make sure that we agree with each other on what we want to achieve, keep a record of our progress, and ultimately um, act on it. Um, set time limits, take responsibility for what happens, what, whether it goes right or wrong, but responsibility simply means to respond creatively. The ability to respond creatively instead of being a bundle of conditioned reflexes or nerves that is constantly being triggered by people and circumstance into predictable outcomes. And then the seventh uh, uh, letter here, S stands for synchronicity. Over the years, as I've interviewed and spoken to important leaders throughout the world, throughout the world, um, 
they all seem to have one thing uh, that seems common that they say. If they are uh, religious, they say, God was on my side. If they are spiritual, which means they are self-aware and also have a sense of the sacred, they say, I happened to be in the right place at the right time, or there were a lot of meaningful coincidences, or simply sometimes they say, I was lucky. So having studied this over the years, I have realized that the common factor here is meaningful coincidences and synchronicities, and our life is full of them. And people who have good luck are simply those who recognize that good luck is opportunity meeting preparedness. And today, with the crisis, that is the opportunity. And the preparedness is the degree to which we can be leaders of our own lives, leaders of our own families, leaders of our own communities, leaders of our countries. And ultimately, we are leaders um, that are engaged with this new leadership across the world through online and offline communities. So um, I know some of you here listening to me uh, come from a Punjabi background, as do I. There are three words that we use in Punjabi. Seva, which means service. Uh, simran, which means remembering our true nature as spiritual beings having a human experience. Simran, remembrance. Seva, Simran, and Sangha. Sangha means community. And if we embark on this, we can actually actualize the vision of the new leadership that awaits us if we want to create a new world with a new worldview. So may I have the next slide, please? And, uh, you know, just to put things in perspective, uh, if you look at the ha last 100 years, every time there's been a crisis, the First World War brought out AM radio, and that was also the time of the pandemic, the global pandemic. The Second World War, out of uh, the aftermath was the emergence of television. The internet came after the Great uh, Recession in 1988-89, and then the mobile phone in the year 2000 after 9-11 or around the 9-11. And then we had uh, smartphones. And now we have all this amazing technology, including VR and Zoom. And we can converse with each other. I can guarantee you when this pandemic is over, there'll be even newer technologies that will help us rewire our global brain because that's what the internet is, our global brain. We can create great distress through the internet as is being proved right now in the American election, but um, you can also begin a process of transformation and healing through rewiring our global brain through interfaith dialogue, through interfaith um, uh, uh, expression of our desires for a better world, but also through practices that increase our awareness, whether they are practices that harness our creativity or our vision or strengthen and complement our strengths. May I have the next slide, please? So uh, here are some resources that you can um, um, look at on some of the information that's coming out, particularly around COVID-19 and how to minimize inflammation and maximize integration. Uh, next slide, please, uh, if we can have the next slide. Uh, um, this is basically the vision I want to share with you. Together, we can help to create a more peaceful, just, sustainable healthier and joyful world. We are at the end of the slide presentation. So let me summarize where I think we can go together. I think this is a time for a grassroots movement where none of us feel alone. Our foundation, Chopra Foundation, has a foundation uh, division called neveralone.love, where we help harness collective creativity, collective vision, improve mental hygiene, depression, anxiety. These are all associated with both chronic and acute illness. And look at the body-mind as one entity, just like wave particle is one entity, mass energy is one entity, body-mind is one entity, and they're both the expressions of your innermost being, which... Uh, 
the great spiritual traditions call um, call uh, the sacred source that we all are which is we are spiritual beings having a human experience it doesn't matter what route we take to self awareness but unless we recognize that there's a divine part in us that reflects the divinity of the absolute infinite being allah ein self brahman doesn't matter the word but there is a deeper intelligence in the universe that reflects and is reflected in the ecosystem of existence that deep intelligence your own soul has access to it you have an inner intelligence within you that is the ultimate and supreme genius and mirrors the wisdom of the universe and unless we go to that deep intelligence which is beyond our ideological frameworks then the world is in trouble but if we go to that deep level and harness our creativity with love in action we can definitely actualize our vision for a more peaceful just sustainable healthier and joyful world so with that i will stop thank you deepak for a wonderful talk already i'm feeling a bit elevated um, so let me start with the first question from we have a flurry of questions from all over the world uh, let me start with a uh, with our dear friend salman ahmed he sent a question to you yes salman uh, is a dear friend of mine too yes indeed um, he said th uh, thanks for uh, for your profound insight deepak what can artists writers poets composers and storytellers do to shine a light on truth compassion and empathy in these trying times that's a, the most important question i i think that can be asked uh, salman sir thank you for um, asking that question um, because you know right now we are romantically obsessed with science science has given us this technology that we're using right now to speak with each other science biological science has a great promise with gene uh, monitoring and so on we are obsessed with science but science can be both divine and diabolical it's science that has given us nuclear weapons has given us biological warfare that has caused eco destruction climate change so science without art is actually bankrupt it's evil but when you bring in art when you bring in music when you bring in poetry when you bring in mushairas and you bring in the remembrance simran which is we call the remembrance zikr in urdu it's called zikr when you bring that in into your life then you realize that artists are the conscience of the world artists are the conscience when you have totalitarian regimes in the world they don't go after the scientists they can buy the scientists but they cannot buy true artists <laughs> true artists whether they are hip hop artists or street poets or they are urdu uh, nobel laureates it doesn't matter artists speak with a conscience and that is what we read right now we need an artistic revolution in the world where we revive not only the indigenous arts of the world and the great heritage we have in art the the whole body of urdu literature the whole body of uh, poetry the whole body of music the whole body of conversation that strikes at the soul art is the language of our soul science is the language of the ego and the intellect which we need to some extent but without art we are bereft we have no conscience and this is what actually the totalitarians of the world watch them just watch the political leaders of the world see how much art they have in their life how much laughter they have in their life look at their faces and see their body language can they be moved by poetry or by by music because if they can't then they have lost their soul absolutely indeed as uh, as uh, rumi said shed the cleverness embrace the wilderness that's it that's rumi it. also so, said get rid of your cleverness and embrace your bewilderment if you're not bewildered 
by your existence, your humanity is incomplete. Indeed. Thank you so much. So the next question is, what is the importance of global citizenship in these disruptive times? And how can leadership responsibility be demonstrated at local and global levels? I think this is a very important question because for this new emergence of global and local leadership, it has to be a grassroots movement. It has to be an emergence. And it has to involve both technology and local activity. So local activity is very important. Online and offline communities of those three things that I mentioned, service, remembrance, zikr, and a new vision with a new community, which is both local and global, we can exchange our ideas, we can exchange our strengths, we can exchange our resources, we can ex even offer, you know, today it's possible to live in Karachi and have a job in Chicago, or to live in New York and have a job in another country, that that's going to happen, you know, it's going to happen anyway, where we are going to have financial interdependence, and global creativity and global leadership, it's going to happen. Unless, of course, we are hell-bent on destroying ourselves. Indeed. Um, so there's one very quick uh, one. Can any human conquer negative ego 100%? As long as you have a body, you cannot conquer your ego 100%. But you can put it in the background. So, you know, every time your ego adds up, your body feels tight. You feel uh, something happening in the body. And so, you know, you can't fight your ego. Fighting the ego is the ultimate melodrama of the ego itself. You say, I want to fight my ego. The one who says, I want to fight my ego is the ego. So, you know, the only way to handle the ego is to observe it. And when your ego acts up, your body doesn't feel good. It feels tight. So observe the tightness and keep observing it till it goes away. And you get into the habit of that, less and less will the ego be in the foreground and maintain itself in the background. Thank you, Deepak. Um, another question, women leaders are more transformational than men leaders. And what is your view in encouraging women in business to become part of the leadership? And I would say not just business, but I would say politics as well, so given the success stories that we've seen. Well, right now, this is a very important conversation because leadership traditionally has been male and uh, has been male for uh, obvious reasons. As hunter gatherers, we lived in patriarchal societies where the hunter had to go out, get uh, food, kill an animal, bring it home, etc., etc. So the male patriarchal system embraced leadership and that's part of our evolutionary history. But right now, that same archetype of masculinity, archetype of masculinity means conquest, predation, initiative, discipline, all good things, strength. But if it goes overboard, then you see what happens in the world. Okay, this is the legacy of the male leadership gone out of control. So now there's a movement that says, how can we embrace the feminine in our own being? And that's not only true for women, it's true for men as well. How can we embrace uh, the, the feeling that we all have for beauty, for truth, for intuition, for nurturing, for affection, for tenderness? These are healing feminine archetypal energies that need to now come out and heal the world. And these are actually embraced in every spiritual tradition as the divine aspects of the feminine. There's a divine aspect of power, which is feminine. There's a divine aspect of motherhood, which is nurturing. There's a divine aspect of the feminine, which says, I connect with nature and healing. There's a divine aspect of the feminine, which says transformation and beauty and intuition and nurturing and tenderness and healing. And it's time that we embrace that because the old paradigm is going to lead otherwise to further distress. So 
women right, right now need to take leadership roles. Men need to embrace those leadership roles and actually to great extent follow that arc archetype, the feminine archetype in their own lives. Because unless we embrace the feminine, even in our own lives as masculine beings, our humanity is incomplete. Absolutely, indeed. Um, so we'll just take two quick questions. Uh, one is uh, the feeling of Black Lives Matter is a feeling held by many minorities around the world. What can be done to overcome centuries of this feeling? Okay, what I'm going to say might be very politically um, incorrect, but it's the truth. We are seeing the aftermath of uh, 500 years of colonialism that started in Europe. And that is also the legacy of slavery, but it's also you and me right now. We are descendants of colonial empires that came to the world and said, oh, we want to civilize you. We want to educate you. We want to give you all this interesting knowledge, but also ended up being slavery, servitude, rape, pillage and murder all in the name of crown. Now this has epigenetic in, uh, implications. Our genetic activity is actually influenced by this history of servitude and slavery throughout the world. And so even there is a lack of self-esteem, people want to emulate the best of the West everywhere in the world. And they, therefore that indicates a lack of self-esteem. And also the, the descendants of colonial empires have a superior attitude, which is genetically, epigenetically programmed into their biology. So this is a very tremendous task that we all have to undertake as descendants of people who are violated. And that is programmed into our biology. It cannot come from revenge. It cannot come from resentment, but it can come from saying, what is the future story of humanity? And the future story of humanity has to be maximum diversity and maximum transparency and maximum honesty in order to heal what we call post-traumatic distress. Right now, there's multi-generational trauma, which is causing biological distress across the world. And we are not recognizing it. We can, Black Lives Matter is a very important movement, but it will fizzle out if we don't address the history of enslavement, the history of servitude, and the history of colonialism. Honestly, straightforward, and say, how can we together create the new story for humanity? That's where the artists come in. That's where people like Salman and people like other artists globally come in. This is an this is a responsibility for the artists of the world. So Deepak, let me conclude with a personal question. I know we are all optimists, but are we hopeful given that we are at the edge of certain irreversible disasters like global warming, the doomsday clock? Do you think the society, let's say Black Lives Matter is one of the manifestation that is happening right now? Do you think we are at a tipping point of a global societal change because our time is also running out before we go into this uh, phase of irreversibility. I mean, to be totally honest, uh, to be totally honest, uh, it's, it's a choice right now. You know, hope is for me, not the right word. Hope indicates despair. Okay, you don't only have hope when you have despair, <laughs> otherwise there's no reason to be hopeful. So we have to be independent of hope and despair. We have to harness our creativity. There I feel there is a chance. We have to harness our creativity. And that's I come back to the artistic revolution. Art is the expression of creativity and storytelling. To have a new story is our only hope. If we want to use the hope. But ultimately, we have to be responsible. We have to be sober. We have to get out of melodrama. And we have to be independent of hope and despair and say to ourselves, what is our collective vision? What are we going to do about it? And when? The time is now. 
or you might as well go to the bar and get drunk, you know, because the world is saying right now, you know, existence is saying I need to be repaired. And existence is not just about you or me, it's about life. And life is being threatened. And that's what COVID-19 showed us, that life is being threatened, not just human life, the life of our planet is being threatened. And unless we go from just me to us and we and the oneness that is at the heart of creation, we, have, we, are, we should be prepared for the worst. For so, the worst. So, so, uh, so Deepak, they say that you can count the uh, seeds in one apple, but you cannot ca count the apples in one seed. That so, is so Deepak, true. Uh, so, so hence, we look at influencers, global influencers like you, to be the Johnny Apple seeds of, uh, of uh, our times and hopefully bring about that transformation. Uh, thank you so much. With this, I'm going to pass on to our, uh, to our President Rasul for his vote of thanks. Thank you thank so you. much. God bless. Thank you. Thank God you. bless. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Amin. Um, Dr. Chopra, this has been an illuminating, thought-provoking, um, deeply reflective hour, at least for, for me, and I'm sure for the many people who have uh, signed on to listen to you today. Uh, let me begin by expressing our very deep gratitude for, to you for not just the time that you have devoted uh, to us, but also your ideas, your thoughts, your reflections, because they have caused us to reflect on perhaps our own lives. And certainly as I uh, listen to you and the fact that you used words that relate to crossroads, the future story, and who is going to write the future story? You talked about the artists, but I think the young people too have a responsibility to ask themselves, what do they want to make of this world? What would they like the world to be for them and for their children? And what is wrong with the world that needs to be corrected? And uh, there is a confluence as you described of a number of forces that come together. But when you take it as an individual responsibility and an individual, um, action that people have to take. I think it's very important that we, we, uh, we take that. And I, I love your quote about that good luck is the opportunity meeting preparedness. I think there is a lot of opportunity that's going to come out of this, as you demonstrated with the graphs. After every crisis, there was some innovation that took place, some creativity. And I think that, uh, are we prepared, is your question, to take advantage of these opportunities to create the luck or the outcome uh, the positive outcomes that come from this. So that's really very, uh, very, very uh, thought provoking, as I said. Uh, thank you very much again. Thank you to the audience for listening. Thank you to the special lecture series group led by Kulsum and everybody who worked for this. Thank you to the uh, IT group who made this technical uh, presentation possible uh, without any hitch. And I also want to welcome and thank the people who joined from the Smiley TV audience. Uh, who joined us today. And so uh, thank you to all of you for listening and I will pass it back uh, to Kulsum. Thank you, President Rasul. I will just close with adding my thanks uh, to our speaker, Dr. Chopra. It's been an honor uh, to all of our guests for joining us. And there were many, many more questions that we couldn't accommodate, uh, but clearly this has been very illuminating and enlightening for everyone. Thank you all.